a very good afternoon or good evening, whenever you may be watching us today. Welcome into another episode of Hotty Toddy Talk. He's Nick. I'm Austin. And we are here. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this one's not going to be as pleasant of a show as they have been right. uh, after this past weekend as Ole Miss is, uh, loses the series, I should say. They weren't swept. They lose the series to the Tennessee Volunteers, two games to one. Up in Knoxville, uh, both the losses were run rule losses, gave up 15 runs each in both of those games. Uh, it was not pretty uh, uh, for most of the weekend for Ole Miss, but we'll start with the positive as, be- as much as we can. Uh, and that, of course, was on Saturday. The only, the only uh, right. real positive today uh, of the day was was Saturday with Liam Doyle putting up another 10 strikeout outing uh, as he got another great uh, win for Ole Miss or, or gave put Ole Miss in position to get the win, I should say. Right. Um, and uh, Ole Miss was able to come through uh, with some late heroics in that one. Uh, Nick, you know, we talked about it in the preview show. This would likely be one of the toughest, if not the toughest, series that Ole Miss played. Uh, and it proved to be just that. Uh, is they, they just uh, they they were no match for the balls this weekend. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, we talked about. It. You know, it, it, it was going to be tough sledding. Um, obviously, the offense. We saw their offense. You know, like you mentioned, uh, the two run rule wins for them, and they just. Uh, it seems every time you looked up or looked down, they were hitting a home run. Ball was leaving the park. So, really struggled there. Um, and yeah, kind of. It was just almost like football. You know how they say a tale of two halves. Well, for us, it was a tale of different days you know Saturday Friday bad Saturday pretty good and then back to you know kind of Friday's ways on Sunday so yeah tough weekend for sure yeah tough weekend and uh, of course the toughest part of the weekend was on the mound uh in particular uh your boy you Gunnar Dennis who who was been our uh kind of, he was kind of the, the shining star uh, in his first few outings mm-hmm. uh boy Friday night 3.2 innings, gave up nine hits and 10 runs, gave up four home runs in that game. It was out of hand early uh, in yeah. that one, and, and Ole Miss really didn't have much of a shot. Uh, and you start to get concerned a little bit about Dennis. I mean, yeah, he got the win in his last outing prior to this at South Car- against South Carolina, um, but it was not a, it was not pretty for it, – it was a not, not very good control in that game. He hit four batters against South Carolina – now he comes up to Tennessee and he gives up four homers and ten hits or ten runs, nine hits. Um, it just was not. It's not been a good couple of nights for Gunner, and you you have to start to wonder: Is Mike going to make some changes uh, when it comes to the rotation? We're going to get into that a little bit more. Uh, but but Friday was just not was not good. I mean, the the offense couldn't get anything going, and then you just give up run after run after run, and and it didn't take long to realize this series might get out of hand. Yeah, and, and we mentioned it. You know, if, if you allow uh, this Tennessee team to jump on you early, which they did, and especially, you know, with the weather, the way it was, you know, it was hard to find anything outside, you know, to, to give you that um, that just little jolt of energy, you know, that big hit or whatever, in which we kind of, you know, kind of reverted back to our old ways of early in the season. You know, we did leave some a lot of runners on base. You know, we got some on, but when we got them on, it seemed that we weren't able to get them in. So, yeah, just – and like, like I said, it just got out of hand early, and it was tough to, um, you know, imagine, you know, just with how it was going, them coming back and winning that game. Yeah. Uh, now, you know, again, Saturday was – Saturday. if you're going to – let's look at the positive overall, right. okay? Because we – obviously, nobody wants to spend a lot of time talking about Friday and Sunday. I mean, those, those were – Ugly games, and this is not going right. to be a long show. I mean, you know, right. who wants to sit around watching us talk about a, a two out of three game series loss that was just 30 runs in, in the two losses combined? Um, but Saturday for a second, um, Ole Miss has the lead. Uh, they, they've got they've got that game that was it was a two nothing game, and then of course Tennessee came back, but then they took the four two lead late. Now you you were certainly concerned about the base runners that were being left, and you just it, there were too many innings left, and we all kind of knew. You can't mess around with Tennessee. And sure enough, the balls come back and actually end up taking the lead uh, going into the ninth inning. And then Ole Miss did uh, something that you really didn't expect with the way that series was going. And that, of course, was to come back and score four runs in the top half of the ninth, yes. take the eight to five lead. So, And then they came in and shut the door in the bottom half. That was despite Friday and Sunday and despite the ugly overall appearance of this series – you have to like what you saw with the grit and determination on Saturday because last year we didn't see that at all. Yeah, you're, you're correct, 100%. Um, yeah, we could be sitting here uh, talking about a, a three-game series sweep and it it could be a lot worse. So, yeah, you have to, like you said, um, really admire how they kind of got off the mat after Friday night's 
loss and come back Saturday, you know, and, and it was kind of just a back and forth game. You know, we got some, they got some. And yeah. And then M Mason Nichols out of the bullpen, you know, nails. I think it was one and a third and four strikeouts. All of his outs were strikeouts. And he really, um, you know, held, held ten Tennessee's offense at bay. And then, like you said, the, the four runs in the top of the ninth was, you know, what, what you wanted to see in a close game, you know, and, and we talked about it. Liam Doyle gave you your best shot to win his, you know, on Saturday. And you had to at least take one to kind of, you know, not be, like I said, sitting here talking about a uh, series sweep. Yeah. And uh, on that note, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and go ahead and get this out of the way early because I know we don't want to, that, he's really the most positive point that we had to talk about, honestly, for the, for the entirety of the series. So let's go ahead and get your player of the weekend. All right, Nick, the floor is yours. Obviously, I think uh, pretty much anybody uh, knows who the most positive point of this weekend was, and uh, and for good reason you have picked him as your player of the weekend. Yeah, uh, Liam Doyle. Yeah, like, like we said, back-to-back um, -back weekends, 10 strikeouts. Uh, he only allowed three hits, three on runs through six complete innings. And, um, yeah, he's just been the um, – you know, when he – since he's entered the starting rotation, he's been, you know, exactly what we needed from him, you know, that guy that kind of steps in, you know, when, when you have that – situation to um you know make changes in your weekend rotation so um yeah and and I think you know you had mentioned it earlier you know and uh probably a looming rotation change coming if, if I had to guess um and there's probably some speculation whether or not we, we talked about it uh, amongst ourselves um whether or not you kind of leave him in the Saturday role or Friday role either way I don't as, as long as he's in the rotation he gives you your best shot to win so um I don't think with as well as with as well as he's doing, I don't think you can move him from the Saturday spot, which you and I yeah. kind of talked about. So um, it'll be interesting to see what, if any, changes are made to the weekend rotation. But I definitely expect something, to, uh, some kind of change to be made. Yeah, we talked about that, and I was and I was about to bring that up too. So you you uh, you took the word right out of my mouth there. I mean, as far as you know, I I think I, I know that the typical philosophy uh, obviously is. That your Friday night guy is your best guy. That your ace pitches right. Friday night. He sets the tone. I get that. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. Doug Nikhazy yeah. was our Friday night guy when Doug Nikhazy was here, and then uh, Hunter Elliott was a Friday night guy when uh, last year or 2022. So I, I get the philosophy. Uh, however, for for whatever reason, Liam Doyle is thriving right now in that Saturday role, and you've got two guys yeah. bookending him right now that are really struggling. Yeah. And so my personal thought was. That if you're that you leave Doyle up Saturday, and the reason for that is because if you win Saturday, if you win Friday's game, if Gunner can get his control back, and you've got a winnable series coming up with Kentucky, despite they played well, but it's a winnable series, and right. you've got you've got that series coming up. You win Friday, well, then you've got your best guy on the mound, and he can get you that early series win potentially, and you're not right. and there's not as much pressure. Whereas if you lose Friday, which Ole Miss has uh, th did this weekend. Then you have your best guy to get that bounce back win, which he did, and now you're you're at least knowing you're not going to get swept, which then takes the pressure off of Sonia a little bit. So as opposed to you get that Friday night win every weekend because Doyle's great, but then you have Dennis and Sonia back to back who are struggling, and right. then you have to, you know then you're you're banking on them trying to get a win so you don't lose the next the last two every weekend. So my thought is, don't fix what's not broken. If it ain't broke, right. don't fix it. Right. Doyle's thriving on Saturday. I leave him where he's at personally. Yeah, I, I don't disagree at all. You know, just kind of like you said, why, why are you going to, you know, mess up something that's going well, you know, and then if if you move him to Friday, you know, that's another day. If, if he pitches this Friday, that's another day of rest he loses. So, yeah, I think you, you have to leave him where he is. But, yeah, and, and you mentioned Sonia, you know, he he's had – um, it's been tough for him. You know, the best one obviously was that – that Sunday against Iowa where he was nearly perfect. But, um, you know, he, he hasn't been getting the uh, run support, you know, wh whether it's outside of the high point game. I think it's – I did the math. It's like just a little over four runs a game he's getting um, run support. So, yeah. especially on a Sunday, you know, when you have a depleted bullpen and um, you, you have to ask a guy to come in and basically hold him to three runs um, against some of these – SEC offenses that are, are coming to the yard every day and swinging it like like Tennessee was and will I 
I foresee for the rest of the season, probably in my opinion, they're an Omaha team. So yeah, it's, it's just, um, and, and you hate it for guys that, you know, go out there talent and all that aside, just go out there and really just have a, a tough go at it, which it kind of seems that Sonia has. Yeah. I mean, if Tennessee doesn't make it to Omaha again this year, I mean, you have to wonder uh, at some point when, when the, the balls fan base, which is extremely passionate, uh, what they're going to have to say about Vitello if he, if he right. goes down again prior yeah. to, Omaha, yeah. despite how good he's been. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, it's a cracker box stadium up there too. Lindsey oh, Nelson yeah. stadium is very home run friendly. And yeah, I get it. Ole Miss had that. They took their at bats in the same stadium mm-hmm. as Tennessee did. I get that. But obviously the home team's different. It's, when you have a high powered offense, like, like Tennessee, obviously they're going to thrive in that stadium. Uh, and, and I mean, that stadium is extremely home run. I mean, Andrew Fisher hit two homers over the scoreboard this weekend, right. 445 feet, just, you know, bombs. I mean, Braden Randall, let's, Braden Randall, I love the kid. Doesn't have a lot of pop on him. Let's just, he's yeah. a small little kid and he hit two out of that park, you know? Right. So, you know, it's, it's a very home run friendly park. Okay. So uh, we, we take that in consideration. That being said though, you know, that going into that stadium, you have to miss bats. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and Ole Miss simply didn't. And we're, I'm going to get into that a little bit more in a minute because it's, it's a time for a little dose of reality uh, when it comes to Ole Miss baseball. However, uh, back to our conversation we were just having for just a moment. Um, if you had to make a change on Friday or Sunday, uh, we talked about this a little bit amongst ourselves. Mm-hmm. It's hard to determine who you would put there. Right. The obvious first choice for most people is Riley Maddox. Right. Maddox hasn't pitched against SEC bats this year. He hasn't even had any relief outings against SEC bats this year. My personal feeling is you put him in in a couple of relief outings, see how he does against SEC bats here in the near future and let somebody else start your midweek game. What say you? Um, Yeah, I'm glad you brought it up because, you, you know, it, you, you want to make a change and then you kind of go and look, you know, and say, okay, well, well, who's it going to be? You know, like you mentioned, you know, uh, Maddox hadn't made a uh, SEC – appearance yet this season and you know haven't seen him against SEC bats since his freshman year so um yeah it, it's tough to you know kind of and then obviously you can't go back to JT Quinn well I mean you could but haven't heard his update on his injury which um we haven't seen him since then so I'm, I'm sure you know he, he'll be out for some time so yeah it, it's it's tough obviously I think your first pick is Maddox but it's just kind of you know you, you know you kind of got to be careful what you wish for. If you want to make a change, you know, it's kind of like, okay, well, well, what, what, what's your next card? Pick the next card. So it's, it's, it's kind of tough for sure. It's very tough. I mean, and, and there are other names you could look at. I mean, you could even go with like a Braden Jones, right. uh, you know, and see how he does. Obviously you've got Mason Morris in there, you know, that, that started a couple of games. And I mean, he's, you know, he's kind of been up and down. Uh, you obviously you can't use Austin Simmons as a starter because he's going to be on some form of pitch count with Lane Kiffin. I mean, right. there's just no, that's just how that's going to be. So you can't even think about him. Plus, you don't want uh, you know if I'm going to make a change, I don't know about making it another lefty. It just kind of depends on how good they are. Yeah. You know, um, you know you've got uh, Kyler Carmack who was a starter at Arkansas State. He hasn't started for Ole Miss. Um, yeah, Wes Mendez has been okay. So you know it's there are names out there. Uh, you right. know, but but. For Ole Miss, you don't really have anyone who is a consistent starter um, in that list. So you, other than Maddox, who's only started midweek games this year. Mm-hmm. So, and as you say, JT Quinn is unavailable. Uh, he injured his back. Don't know the update on that. And he hasn't been sharp in the starts he has made. Right. So, you, so then you're you're concerned about that. So, um, yeah, I think you've got to. You can't just go in and make one fell swoop change. I think you have to bring some of these guys in, maybe out of the pen against SEC bats and see how they do, because that's the only way you're going to know how they're going to face these lineups. Yeah, and and, and you saw it this weekend with Tennessee, kind of with, with their Sunday um, strategy. They kind of went with the opener. You know, that guy, he, he didn't he wasn't in long. And and we've seen Bieko do it before and not really name a starter, just kind of, it, like I said, an opener. You just kind of roll a guy out there to get you some outs. And if, if he's going well, he's going well. And if he's not, you know, you, you don't tap him that starter and put that pressure on him and say, hey, you've got to go five, six innings and, you know, really limit the damage against some really good offenses. So if you kind of have the luxury of rolling a guy out there and say, hey, get, get us, you know, six, seven outs and, and we'll go from there, kind of just piece it together. So it, it'll be interesting to see what happens. I know normally Mike does a little radio show on Monday, Monday afternoon. So I'm sure that's – and that's typically where he announces that pitching change. So we yeah. uh, we shall see. 
Yeah, and I have, I, that that should be later tonight, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. They normally they normally do that at Bure, I believe, kind of the Reb Talk show that David Kellum hosts with with the coaches. Um, so I would imagine, yeah, as you say, we'll hear something from Mike on that tonight. Maybe not, though. I mean, he might still be thinking about it. You never know. Right. Um, but that being said, uh, th- that brings us to the point where at some point you've got to just talk about things realistically. It, it would be great if everything was sunshine and roses. It really would. I mean, obviously, we all want Ole Miss to to win every game they play. I mean, that's just right. how. But it doesn't happen that way, especially not in the SEC. The fact is, though, if you look at this Ole Miss team, particularly over the last two years, but even in the national championship winning season, they had struggles for, for a long time. I mean, they were 7-14 and 14 in the conference at one time during that season before they made that miracle run. Um, but the fact is Ole Miss needs a pitching coach. And that's just the side. I mean, that we have gotten to a point where there is clearly and, – and Grayson Sanye. I love Grayson Sanye. This, I, I'm not taking shots at Grayson Sanye by any way. But when it when he faces SEC competition, he has one win in his entire career so far. Now, granted, it's only been two years or a year and a half, whatever you want to call it. Um, but if you look at if you look at this season, he went four and a third against South Carolina, gave up nine runs or nine hits and six runs. He made it two and two thirds against Tennessee, six hits, seven runs. Now, granted, he should have been pulled uh, sooner in that Tennessee game. Um, so part of that falls on Mike. Uh, because you, you, he clearly didn't have it, and Ole Miss was actually back in that game. It was a one possession or one run game. I should say one possession, uh, one run game, and then of course Tennessee exploded. Um, so, but there is a clear issue with pitcher development on this Ole Miss team. If you look around the conference at the top tiers of the conference, your LSU's who struggled, granted, so far, but you look at their pitching staff: Texas A and M, Arkansas, even Mississippi State. Um, you know, down the road, they develop pitchers. And not, not only do they develop pitchers, they have pitchers who have more than one or two pitches that they can throw in there. They're not just throwing a 96 fastball and then throw in a slider every now and then. This is a multi-pitch, three to four pitch hurlers that are good. And they are being developed by pitching coaches. Vanderbilt, that you Auburn, these guys have pitching labs for crying out loud. Now, yeah, some of these teams struggle. That's part of the battle, the, the the brutal battles of the SEC. But if you look at it, if you take back an objective, take a step back and objectively look at where Ole Miss is in relation to the rest of the conference, other than maybe a team like Missouri, you know, somebody like that. But if you look at the overall conference as a whole, Ole Miss is well behind when it comes to developing pitching staffs. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. Um, and, and, you know, kind of just to myself, I don't know if I've ever mentioned this to you, but it almost sometimes feels like Ole Miss has throwers and not pitchers. Yeah. And and l- like you say, you know, Grayson Sanye, he comes in as a freshman and starts in the SEC, in a, a rotation for an SEC baseball team. That that doesn't happen by happenstance. They just – that doesn't happen overnight. So the, these most of the, all these guys have the talent, and we see it in flashes. But it's just like you said, the development of being able to get these guys to do, have those not turn those flashes into being consistent, you know. And and it was it was funny. I was actually talking with a good friend, and they really don't. It's hard, you know. Some of these guys just have God given talent, like a, a Casey Mize. I don't know if you remember Casey Mize, yes. but he was the guy at Auburn. He came out every Friday night and gave you seven, eight innings double digit strikeouts and Auburn won Friday nights. Just it, write it down, chalk it up. Don't, don't even use chalk Sharpie. <laughs> yeah. it's, just, it's just, we kind of lack, we don't lack those type of guys. Although that was a, that was a uber talented pitcher, but it's just like you said, the development of having these guys and freshmen, that, that's a different story, but you know, in your second year around, you know, the, there's gotta be some kind of maturity on, both the coaching staff and the player side that kind of comes and meets together and say, Hey, we got this thing figured out, you know, we're pitchers, not throwers. So yeah, yeah. it's definitely something that needs to be addressed. I agree with you. So um, yeah. it, and it's, you know, if we are making decisions, we, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be sitting here. Right. Right. So it, yeah. it's just, um just in kind of, like you said, just objectively, you know, us, you know, seeing what we see and just kind of giving it to you guys. Like you said, it's not always sunshines and rainbows. Some things got to be said sometimes. Yeah. So, and yeah. and I think every all Ole Miss fans kind of feel the same way. 
Yeah, and it's and it's by no means taking shots at the kids. It's by no means taking shots at the coaching staff. We're not out here yeah. saying these guys suck and they should right. none of none of that. Right. I mean, look, you you've got these kids that are out there giving everything they have every single mm-hmm. time they take the mound, and it, it's a struggle. But and and look, you like you mentioned the God given talent, Hunter Elliott. I mean, a prime example of that. Right. The guy's just got phenomenal talent. Dylan Delusia. I mean, the most rubber arm you've ever seen in your life. Right. I mean, you look at some of these guys that just have – you can't coach some of these things. You can't right. coach a guy like Hunter Elliott to be a freshman and help Ole Miss win a national championship on the biggest right. stage. It just doesn't happen like that. you know. So some of these guys just have that talent, as you said. Uh, but then some of the guys have clear issues with their command or their lack of pitcher control, whatever the case may be, that has to be nurtured, has to be developed. And yeah. that falls on the coaching staff to get that in line. Some way right. or another, at some point, You've got to look at it. And I don't know what the reasoning is, why Ole Miss doesn't have a true pitching coach, because they don't. It's not a secret that they don't. Um, And I get Mike's a catcher. He was a catcher. He's got catchers on his staff. They develop catchers. Ole Miss is catcher you for a reason. This is, you know, these things are great. But at some point, you have to have someone who can step into a bullpen session with a pitcher and develop the pitching, coach the pitching, talk about the pitching. Not everything around the pitching, help the pitching. Because if it's one thing the SEC has shown in the last several years, pitching wins championships, mm-hmm. period. If you, I mean, Ole Miss won a championship on the back of Hunter Elliott and Brandon Johnson. You know, yeah, they had that. They had Tim Elko and they had Kevin Graham and they have Justin Bench. And yeah, the three home runs in a row certainly helped. Offense definitely helps right. you. Mm-hmm. But in that first, in the second game, it was down to the wire and Ole Miss had the pitching to pull it off. You look at what the pitching does for these other teams, and it and it will carry you. So at some point, you've got to have the pitching, other because it's not like you know a Hugh Freeze offense when when he was at Ole Miss, where you just try to outscore everybody. At some point, that's right. going to catch up to you, just right. as it did with the football team. So at some point, you got to yeah. have that coaching. Yeah, I, I agree, and it's it's just you know something, and it's not something that will you know happen obviously in the middle of the season, but it, it's just something. And then th- there's another problem, and there's probably another conversation for a different day but you know they only get the certain amount of paid assistance and there's not yeah. many they, that, that that's another thing you know that's another story for another day so there there's a lot about it that obviously makes you scratch your head and there, there's more than I think really goes into it and say hey we need a pitching coach well it's okay well yeah. you know you have an unpaid assistant and you have you know another coach and we've got two paid assistants I'm pretty sure it's still two paid assistants one's a hitting coach and one's our recruiting coordinator so it's yeah. it's just it, it's just like you said it's something that has to be addressed but I don't think it's as easy as hey let's hire a pitching coach. So, oh yeah, no, it's definitely not just a, a, a put a little glue on it and it fixes the whole problem. Absolutely, right. but um, you know at the at the end of the day you've got to invest in the kids you recruit uh, and, right. and and when they are pitchers you need to invest in what will help them become better pitchers. Right. People don't come pitchers don't come to play for Ole Miss because they want to play a little college baseball and be done with baseball. That you come to an SEC school because you think that is going to be a program that gets you to the next level, that is competing for a berth in Omaha, that is competing for a national championship, that is a perennial top five, top 17 as they were for so many years. Right. That's what you come to Ole Miss for. You've right. got to put the, you've got to deliver on the investment once you get them right. in Oxford. Mm-hmm. You've got to deliver on the promises you made them. You've got to deliver on the development of that pitcher or you're going to lose them. And that's just the, and the, and the day and age that we are in now, especially. Right. Oh, You've yeah. got to invest in these players or they will go somewhere that that does. And that's just the facts. Um, yeah. So we'll see. Again, it's not just a one size fits all solution. Um, and again, this is by no means uh, none of this conversation. And all of you that have watched us and followed us for this long know we, we're not sitting up here taking shots at, at the players or, or, right. or anybody like that. We love these guys. Right. We want to see them succeed. We are right. fans, that's too. Yeah. We want to see mm-hmm. them succeed. We want to see the team succeed. And the way to do that is by investing in them. Uh, and and I think that that's uh, where we can where we can end that for now. Yeah. Um, all right. We'll end the show real quickly. We'll go around the SEC and we'll talk about Ole Miss's. Uh, we'll give you the time for Ole Miss's Tuesday matchup as they get ready to try to bounce back. Real quick, let's go around the SEC. Well, uh, again, it was another crazy weekend in the SEC. Uh, the home teams have been phenomenal. That's been the story. Uh, basically, I think it's 11 out of 14 um, games the home right. teams yeah. won. Uh, mm-hmm. So, I mean, they, they've been phenomenal. Uh, if you look at the the West, obviously, Arkansas 
is still the pride of the SEC West. They are five and one in the conference. Uh, they had they've had just the one loss. I mean, and it, otherwise yeah. they have been absolutely demolishing everyone they play. Texas A&M actually is three and three. They did drop a game. Uh, at home to Mississippi State this weekend, but they did win that series, uh, and they still have the best record overall in the conference at 21 uh, and three. Uh, if you look at, uh, of course, Mississippi State and Ole Miss are both 17 and eight, three and three. So right there, just yeah. hanging out with each other. That's yeah, where they've been out. the whole season. Uh, LSU lost another series this weekend, uh, so they are uh, the the championship curse lives on. Yeah. For now. The defending yeah. title uh, has not been kind to State or Ole Miss, and so far it's not been kind to LSU. They're two and four in the conference. Uh, Alabama two and four. Auburn, boy, it's been a struggle for them. One and five uh, in the conference. Georgia looking good. Charlie Condon, oh my goodness, boy. not looking forward to facing him here in a few no, weeks. Not at all. Um, he is phenomenal. Kentucky uh, is five and one, twenty and four. That's who Ole Miss has up next. Uh, of course, we'll preview that on Thursday. South Carolina, however, I'm just we don't want to forget that Ole Miss win that they had over South Carolina. That's what last weekend. That's looking really good because really the good. Gamecocks just yeah. swept Vanderbilt yeah. uh, over the weekend. Uh, Vanderbilt three and three overall. South Carolina. Uh, Ethan Petrie, who Ole Miss held very uh, pretty much held him for the whole weekend, except for a couple yeah. of that bats. He went off this weekend against mm-hmm. Vanderbilt. Eli Jones looked phenomenal. Boy, glad the Rebels got the Gamecocks when they did. Yeah. Uh, because that is uh, that that is uh, that was a time to do it. Of course, Tennessee got two out of three against Ole Miss, but uh, that moves Tennessee and Ole Miss both three and three in the conference. So the sky is not falling. The season isn't over. It was a bad series, however, right. winnable stuff coming up. Starting with Kentucky this weekend, we'll talk about that on Thursday. Ole Miss does have Austin P uh, this week on Tuesday. Oh, and don't uh, don't sleep on the governors. Yeah. They beat Mississippi State twice. They've also won a game over Auburn, uh, and they score a lot of runs. Uh, They give up a lot of runs, but they also score a lot of runs. There is no shortage of offense in the games that the Governors are involved in. That game will be at 6.30 uh, on Tuesday night uh, in Oxford, and that will be on the SEC Network. Plus, I would imagine we're going to see Riley Maddox start that game unless Mike makes a change. Right. which we may hear about tonight. But uh, if not, then I will just assume Riley will start until we hear otherwise. Uh, Austin P. of course, hasn't announced who's going to start for them yet uh, either. We're just coming off the weekend. Uh, the Governors did get a sweep uh, over the weekend over Queens, uh, who I know nothing about. Uh, <laughs> but again, this is not a team to sleep on. This is going to be right. a, a tough midweek game uh, for sure for the Rebels. But looking to bounce back after this weekend and get ready for the Kentucky Wildcats coming up next weekend. We'll talk to you guys again on Thursday as usual. You might see it Thursday night. You might see it Friday morning. Either way, you know you're going to get that preview show for the Rebs and the Wildcats. Stay tuned for that, uh, and we will talk to you guys then. Hotty toddy, and have a great afternoon.